other Renaissance, this northern one. It's an astonishing movement that founded some of our most deeply held beliefs about art and about artists. It begins with a new way of painting, but it soon expands to become a true image revolution. At around 1500, a young German painter harnessed a new technology that transformed everything. The printing press made images available to a vastly expanded audience, and this painter used it to become the first world-famous artist. Soon the image revolution of the North became a revolt against images. Instead of making images, people passionately broke them. And in the wake of that destruction, modern art was born. Taken together, these breakthroughs created a Northern Renaissance that changed art forever. In the year 1420, Europe was a continent in the shadow of an unprecedented catastrophe. Just 60 years earlier, plague had wiped out more than a third of the entire population. The church stood divided with rival popes in Rome and Avignon. Meanwhile, the old political powers of the North, England and France, were locked in a conflict that would last 100 years. But one area above all others was flourishing, Flanders in present-day Belgium and Holland. And from there, a profound artistic revolution spread out across the continent. St. Bavo's Cathedral in Ghent still holds the painting, a great altarpiece, that started that revolution. Altarpiece has overwhelmed viewers since it stood complete in 1432. People of the time pronounced it the most beautiful work in Christendom, and its chief creator, Jan van Eyck, was deemed the prince of painters. Today it remains arguably the finest single painting in the world, and of all its many wonders, the one most singled out for praise is the figure of Adam. To early observers, this painted Adam looked like a living being. Paint captures the minute subtleties of flesh. Blood seems to pulse beneath flesh, and the skin of Adam's hands and face is visibly tanned by the sun. One detail intensifies this semblance of animation. Adam raises his big toe so that you can see its underside. The toe seems even to stick out of the stone niche where the figure stands, allowing Adam to appear to step into our world. Remember, this is Adam, Adam who sinned, who therefore died, and who as the ongoing consequence of his sin made us all mortal. In the painting, Adam lives again. Resurrected, he strides towards the paradise he lost. For the first time in the history of art, the dead were seen to live again. And with this rebirth, a new historical epoch began. Here in Northern Europe, this period had a different shape and different heroes than the more famous Renaissance in Italy. 
Yet in a sense, the Northern Renaissance is the more stunning rebirth, and the man who launched it here in Ghent was, according to the people of the time, the greatest painter who ever lived. And through astonishing... tapestries would be woven of silk thread, individually entwined in silver and gold. They told stories commemorating famous victories or religious scenes. But by the beginning of the 15th century, the hunger for such ostentatiously luxurious objects such as tapestry began to be replaced by a taste for something new. And this change took root in the most lavish culture in Europe of the time, the court of the Duke of Burgundy. To recover that now forgotten world, we need to travel south from Flanders. The dynasty of the Dukes of Burgundy had its traditional seat in the wine-growing regions southeast of Paris. But through marriage, diplomacy and war, their territories eventually stretched all the way back to Flanders. In this culture, magnificence publicized power. Indeed, the Dukes sincerely believed that their own lavish spending trickled down to benefit the entire population of Burgundy. According to economic theorists of the day, courtly expenditure was like the wind that drives the windmills, like the rain that fertilizes the fields. The works the Dukes commissioned included hundreds of huge, precious tapestries, enough to cover their many residences inside and out. Useless but staggeringly costly objects made of gold, gems, pearls, and opaque enamel were displayed briefly, only to be melted down to make new confections. Indeed, like the fabulous foods served at Burgundian court festivities, such works took long to prepare but were swiftly consumed. The first Duke of an expanded Burgundy assembled a dazzling team of artists, including one momentous innovator, the Netherlandish sculptor Klaus Sluter. And it's in his work, in the medium of carved stone, that a new realism first appears. Before Sluter, in the great cathedrals of Western Europe, monumental sculpture remained subordinate to architecture. Inert figures stood contained by the structures they embellished. Sluder changed all this. Imagine you lived in the year 1400, and you were asked to predict which art would reign supreme over the...
paintings occur in these ensembles on the shutters, on the outer part, the everyday side. They tell stories and prepare the way for the glorious spectacle that will occur when they open up. And that spectacle, that climax, both ritually as well as aesthetically of the altarpiece, occurs in the medium of sculpture, not painting. The painting on the wings of this altarpiece in Dijon was created by the artist Melchior Bruderlam just 12 years before the Ghent altarpiece. It's typical of painting of the time. And while the stories it tells are clear, the figures in them, and especially the spaces between them, look awkward to the modern eye.
Another single work, the altarpiece in the town of Ghent in Belgium, launched the Renaissance in Northern Europe. It was donated to St. Bavo's Cathedral by one of Van Eyck's other clients, a merchant and the mayor of Ghent, Jos Feit. With its shutters closed, the altarpiece commemorates the donor's piety. Van Eyck shows Feit and his wife in niches, praying to sculpted effigies of saints. Above them, in what seems a cutaway view of an upper room of the actual church, the Virgin receives Christ in her womb. Fight financed an entire private chapel within the cathedral, and it was there, behind the altar, that Van Eyck's great work originally stood. The name is Joost Veit, was mayor of the city of Ghent in the 15th century, and a very rich man. And on the other side... Today, a full-scale copy lets visitors experience the perfect fit between the chapel and the altarpiece. Over the centuries, reports survive of artists astonished by the work. In 1521, the world-famous painter Albrecht Dürer came to view it and pronounced it a priceless painting of profound understanding. By then, less than a hundred years after it was painted, it was already a tourist attraction. Visitors paid high fees to see it. During the iconoclasms that swept Northern Europe in the 16th century, when Protestants smashed the images and churches, Van Eyck's altarpiece was spirited to safety. Under Napoleon, the work was taken to Paris and then was divided up, scattering individual panels across Europe. These were only reunited after the First World War in 1919. Two of the panels were stolen and held ransom in 1934. This one was never recovered. A copy still marks its place. The Ghent altarpiece was designed and painted for this chapel. Every painted object in the altarpiece is shown reacting to light as if it's a real object here in space. And you can see this immediately in the closed form of the altar, in which all the statues and the two donors, the fights, are all lit exactly from that part of the chapel where the sun streams in and would, if these were real statues, cast shadows and highlights in the way they do in Van Eyck's picture. The closed state is complex. The open state is even more complex. Again, everything in the picture reacts to the light and the space exactly as real figures would in such a situation. But here, because of the nature of the subject and because he's added this stupendous element of color, because he's multiplied the detail, the level of relations between the world out here and the world of the picture becomes almost infinite. Every one of the jewels, every part of the complex tapestry of this picture is carefully programmed to react to the light that's in this room. So, for example, the figure of Adam, who comes from the left, has highlights in his eye, whereas the figure of Eve, who is shaded in this real space, has no highlights in her eye. There are even certain jewels, ones on the angels on the left, 
which reflect the actual shape and position of the window which lights them. who claimed that this northern painter personally invented oil paint. Vasari was wrong. Oil was an ingredient in painting long before Van Eyck, as this painting, the Westminster Redible, created 150 years before Van Eyck, shows. But Vasari got right the dazzling new effect Van Eyck achieved in oil. And I've come to the Hamilton Kerr Institute at Cambridge University to discover how Jan van Eyck transformed base materials into beautiful images. They conserve and restore paintings here, and to do this, you have to know how paintings were made. Well, this is ultramarine, lapis lazuli. It's a mineral that he would have got from what's now Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. It's uh, transformed into the pigment ultramarine, mm -hmm. a very rich blue, um, by a very complicated procedure of mm -hmm. processing. Yes, and it seems like there are some imperfections. Yes, there are, mm -hmm. there are impurities in the mineral, copper mainly, which they would have extracted um, during the, the process. To purify the blue. To huh? purify the blue, yes. so that when they were painting with it, it's actually very high quality. Um, it would have been very expensive for that reason, yes. um, and also because of the transportation in those days, going all the way um, into uh, northern Europe. From across the sea, um, ultramarine, yes. yes. What materials might he have used for his reds? In the period, there were mm -hmm. two particular red lakes that were most common. Madder. Madder is a plant. Mm -hmm. It comes from the root. Um, or 
cochineal, um, which is made from the crushed up shells of beetles. Ah, you can see their little bodies still. <laughs> yes, yes. And none are moving, huh? No, they're but, very dry. But, <laughs> right. Make it even more. What yawn? vivid example of this is when it comes to the representation of gold and jewels, something that much of the painting of the time uses to signify holiness. It's notable that Van Eyck didn't use gold leaf to represent gold objects in his pictures. Instead, he painted objects as golden. He never introduced foreign elements into his picture. He never placed upon the panel that he works, for example, an actual jewel. That was common in the period before Jan van Eyck. He creates a consistent surface. And that consistency allows the picture to achieve a, another order of consistency, namely that whatever is in the picture appears consistent with the world outside of the picture. That is, that the whole picture builds up an illusion of a global consistency, which we are...
in a two-dimensional two form. It's because of the way in which you can use glazes uh, to suggest a certain kind of um, uh, vibrancy of the light and reflections which make it feel like there's something coming out of the picture towards you. But also you can use it in the dark colours to suggest space going away behind. Plus, because it stays wet for a little while, if someone comes to sit for you a day or two later uh, and you see something, see them in a different way, you can put that in straight into the picture rather than having to start a whole other layer over the top. Even photography, uh, with all its huge benefits and, and exciting innovations, uh, still can't create the same illusions that a painting can when it's there because of the way the oil painting is built up in layers. And those layers play, play games in, with the light in a way that no, nothing else can do. It's hard now to just imagine what life was like in art, art terms before that, before he was around. Almost more than any other product, paintings are the embodiment of labor. They require not particularly expensive materials. They're made just out of oil and pigments, some expensive, but, but uh, broadly speaking, inexpensive compared to gold and jewels. Uh, and what makes them valuable is the labor that went into making them. Jan van Eyck's labor raised the status of painting almost immediately. The illusions he created were so convincing that in some ways painting could hide that it was painting. And since his products didn't look handmade, he could claim a higher status than that of mere craftsmen working with his hands. But there were also advantages to consumers. Instead of paying for gold and jewels, now they could buy painted substitutes at a fraction of the cost. So to whom did this new art appeal? The Bruges archive holds an amazing collection of records, dating back to the early 15th century, when Bruges was the economic hub of Europe. that the citizenry took already in Van Eyck's art. The visit of the Bruges magistrates documented here marks the beginning of a long mutual relationship between a new type of painting and a new urban elite. And the kind of painting they desired more than any other was a portrait of themselves. A portrait is and ever was a lasting memorial to you. It's something that grants you posterity. It's something your family will keep and value. Portraits had been only there for saints and kings. Um, the new portrait painting allows more modest families to have a replica of grandpa that can be hung on the living room wall. That's a new idea. It also allows you to say, I have had the great Van Eyck paint my portrait. Courts of kings and dukes of Burgundy get Van Eyck portraits. This tells you how important I am. There's a fashion for having yourself painted. It's a very secular urge because this isn't on, a, on a, an altarpiece. This isn't somewhere where people... <laughs>
such as these. Already then, Burgundy produced some of Europe's finest wines. Vineyards generated the region's wealth, and they contributed to Roland's riches, and thus, in a way, made possible Van Eyck's picture itself. By showing Roland's vineyards, Van Eyck takes us back to the artwork's economic source. He shows us that this is as much a part of his painting as are the pigments of which it's made. Roland's vineyards directly funded the running of the hospital and produced the wine drunk at mass before the altar. And while the painting documents both the source of Roland's great wealth and his charitable works, it also represents something else. The painting fulfills one of the deepest desires of Christians of the time, physically to see sacred persons. In Van Eyck's day, people understood vision differently than they do today. They believed that when one saw an object, something of its physical substance entered the eye. They believed, therefore, that sacred things, such as religious images, could enter the soul through the portal of the eye. This belief explains a key aspect of late medieval religion. During Mass, the bread of the host was held to be the body of Christ. And because in seeing something, one participated in its substance by simply beholding the host, one communed with Christ's body. Within churches, there were special places for visual communion. This is one such place, a private chamber built into the side of a church, but it's also part of a domestic space. This here is an amazing survival. It's a private prayer gallery in Bruges, and these windows behind me overlook the Church of Our Lady. But it's built right into someone's private home. Visual experience of the private person is thrusting itself into sacred space. By looking from this prayer chapel towards the altar in the church, we enter into the mechanics of vision as they were understood in Van Eyck's day. Suddenly, the painting of Roland and the Madonna takes on a new meaning. In their prayers, Christians sought above all to visualize the person they worshipped. And so, in Van Eyck's painting, Nicolas Roland can see this wish fulfilled, the content of his prayer sits there as real and palpable as he. Paint has made the Virgin as present, as material as it were, in Roland's experience, as the book he holds, as the vineyards he owns. The story of how Van Eyck transformed painting into the art of arts must end somewhere else, however. This final chapter unfolds in a panel that hangs here in London. This is Van Eyck's most haunting painting. It's an incredibly modern looking image of a man and a woman from long ago inside a bedroom. Everything about the picture is revolutionary. The full-length portraits, the profusion of detail, the sheer complexity of it all. The sequence of its owners attests to its preciousness. It passed almost immediately into royal collections, where it stayed until it came to Britain in the early 19th century. And it's been in the National Gallery ever since, where it remains one of the most popular pictures. It's partly the painting's realism that fascinates. Capturing perfectly the room and its inhabitants, the picture is like a time capsule of lived experience. Once arrived in this room in Bruges at 1434, we become fascinated, even unsettled, by what's taking place in this bygone here and now. Early documents record only a name, Arnolfini. A simple portrait of a man and his wife then, but the picture's too unique and the details too intriguing to leave it there. 
Historians have proposed theories, including a persistent one that Jan van Eyck, with his brush, testified to the event of the couple's marriage. Okay. Two years ago, an art historian published a new theory of van Eyck's masterpiece, which put everything in a completely different light. As it happens, this historian is my wife, and her simple solution to the great puzzle was published the day before our marriage. The center of much of the debate has been the identity of the couple portrayed, since nothing in the picture itself, as it now survives, tells us who they are. For a long time, scholars have known that it was likely to be a member of the Arnolfini family who are from Lucca in Italy, but lived in Bruges. Giovanni Arnolfini was decided upon as the likely candidate. And he had married someone called Costanza Trenta, and everything seemed to be right until it was discovered that she had died at least by 1433, which is the year before the painting is dated. There are several possibilities. One is that it's a different Giovanni Arnolfini, or a different Arnolfini altogether. Another is that there was another wife that's not documented. Or you could decide that it is this woman, Costanza, um, and perhaps it's not a wedding or a betrothal. And in fact, it's not even a straightforward portrait. But everything about it is calling out for a kind of explanation. So, for example, Mr. Arnolfini, the way he seems so melancholic and his gesture is so enigmatic, what is he doing? The difference between the portrayal of his face and her face, most people had said, well, she's idealized because she's a female, and that's true. I mean, she definitely looks, you know, you'd, you'd be hard pressed to find a person who looks like that in real life. She's, she looks like a porcelain doll. Whereas he really looks so convincing as a facial type. Um, so what could that discrepancy be? I started to look at the details that for some have been seen as supporting the marriage claim and for others were seen as just details of, of objects. The mirror at the back which has a lot of connotations um, but one of the details of the mirror are scenes of the passion of, of Christ around the outside. All of the scenes of Christ living are on the side where Giovanni is standing on the left side, and all of the scenes of Christ dead and resurrected are on the right side. It's a daytime scene, but there's a candle burning. I mean, why would Van Eyck include a lit candle in a daytime scene? And why would he bother to show the detail of only two candles, one of which is, has gone out and one of which is burning? The actual juxtaposition, I think, of a lit candle over Giovanni and a gutted candle over Costanza indicates a kind of literal illustration. It's like to just write it off as a kind of snapshot of reality it really misses the point, I think, that's being made. The point that's being made is that she's dead and he's not, that he is basically honoring her um, as, a, as a very important part of his life that's now gone. I'm, I'm certain that mine won't be the last theory. It's a painting that provides endless opportunity for interpretation. It's not for nothing that the mirror is an age-old symbol of death. The images in a mirror are...
immediate and huge. In the Netherlands, his art was the gold standard of a painting industry that flourished in that region until the 17th century and beyond. His lasting influence is felt whenever ambitious artists of any era stake their claim to greatness. Whenever painters propose that painting is the supreme art. And Rather, rows and rows of one kind of thing, namely paintings, each framed and movable, each a little world unto itself. Without Van Eyck, I do not think these peculiar things would have possessed the magic necessary to launch their extraordinary career. So this is another of Van Eyck's legacies, our picture of a picture gallery.